Good morning, New Life. Let's stand to our feet. Can we get a clap of praise this morning for 20 years? Yeah. This is going to be an amazing day today. Let's just lift our hands and let's sing this morning in worship.
this morning. God, we come before you. God, we know that within ourselves, we are nothing, but God, with you, we are everything. God, this morning, as we lift our voices in worship, God, as you take us someplace from the natural into the supernatural, God, it is not by our strength and our power. God, it is by you. God, it is every step that we take, it is because of you. It's because of your grace. It's because of your mercy. It's because of your love, God. And this morning as we sing, God, we are lifting up every ounce of praise, every ounce of worship to you, God. It's all for you this morning. God, in this morning, just move among us. God, if there is a broken heart, Father, wrap your arms around and just give love and strength and peace. God, this morning, we just long to worship you.
Y'all know this song. Come on, sing it out with us. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. Yeah. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. up your song cause you got a lion inside of those lungs so get up and praise the Lord Woo. praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah hallelujah and I know it's not much but I'm nothing else fit for a king except for heart singing hallelujah Again and again. 
Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for my king. Except for my heart singing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's, as we transition into this time of uh, worship through giving, our ushers, if you would take your place. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so much. Uh, what a wonderful day that we have to come together and celebrate you, Father. We've seen your, uh, we've seen how good you've been to us over the past 20 years. You've never failed us, Lord. We've failed you. Uh, we've made mistakes, Father, but you never have. You've been right there with us, Father God. And we thank you for that. We thank you for this opportunity to celebrate 20 years of what you're doing and you're going to continue to do for a new life for us. Let's praise you for that, Father. Father God, we're very aware of it. Everything we got is yours, and we're just called to be good stewards of it, Father God, as we examine our hearts and we, we figure out what kind of sacrifice we have to give to you today, God. It's great you bless the families, give more than the ones that came from. We're so excited, and we want to keep this presence of the Holy Spirit strong in our service today, God, through this time of worship. We praise you in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord another hand this morning. I tell you, uh, I don't know about you, but I feel a little overwhelmed this morning. Y'all probably just feel like you came to church today. Uh, this is an awesome time uh, in my life, my family's life, and I just want to let y'all know uh, how grateful I am to be here and begin this uh, this time in the life of new life to be your pastor. Uh, this is just an awesome responsibility. Somebody's asking me this morning, everybody's going to ask me how you feel, how you feel. I said, well, it, it really don't feel real just yet. <laughs> but just a minute ago, I said it feels real now. <clears throat> it's here. <laughs> uh, me and Kevin were talking about this video we're going to show and who's going to introduce it and all that. And I, I was kind of telling them, well, you can do this, that. And finally I said, well, you know, at some point I got to get up there and say something. So I guess... <laughs> I guess that'll be the best time to kind of get it started. So uh, I do want to recognize my family, though. My wife, uh, Cindy, right here, the most beautiful woman in the, in the room. Uh, and then my, my granddaughter is Lainey, the most beautiful granddaughter uh, in Chilton County. And my daughter, Whitney, my cousin, Kevin, Joel, Terry, my brother, and his, uh, his wife, 
Julia, and then my mom and daddy's back there, Randall and Dale. Uh, and uh, I don't know, my, my son, there he is, I'm trying to find him. Uh, Dalton and his wife, Hannah. Uh, and then uh, uh, just a, a fellow that follows me around like a thorn in my side, Perry uh, Smith, uh, and, and Pam. Glad to have them here this morning. So anyway, uh, y'all will see that I'll be a little bit nervous going through this. So I, I ask that you pray for him. But think about 20 years. 20 years. I've told folks uh, leading up to today that this would be uh, New Life's 20th anniversary. And some folks thought that y'all just started when you built this building. There's a lot of folks didn't know uh, that New Life had been around this long and others couldn't believe it had been uh, 20 years. And so anyway, this, I had asked Kevin and, uh, about a, a video, putting a video together to a song uh, that y'all know you're very familiar with the song. Uh, and, uh, and him and Megan worked on this and kind of brought it to life. Uh, but just a question before we watch this video. How many of you believe God still has greater things for the city of Clanton, for Chilton County, and for New Life? Say amen. Right? Amen. I know, I know the, some of the men who started this, and I know God is with them, and the Holy Spirit has filled them, and so I believe that God is, is in New Life. And so uh, just watch this video and let the Lord speak to you through the song, and I know this is our mission field. Uh, this is this is this is what we're this is what we're going to be doing uh, for the foreseeable future uh, is going after everybody in Chilton County that's not plugged in somewhere. So watch this video and let the Lord speak to your heart through the song. <laughs> God of this city, you're the king of this people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are, there is no one like us. 
And greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. And greater things are still to be done. We believe, we believe. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? It just blows my mind that people have the talent and the gifts to put stuff like that together. Uh, just tell them this is what we want and they make it happen. Uh, the Lord gives everybody gifts to do things. And so I appreciate them for working on that. But I want you to see that that's, that's our mission field. We're, we're not just looking for the guy next door to us. We're not just looking for somebody at this particular school or that particular part of the neighborhood. We're looking for everybody that God wants to reach. Uh, and so wherever you live, wherever you come from across this county, uh, we want you to be reaching those neighbors, reaching those people. That's who we're going after is everybody that don't know Jesus, not any particular class. Uh, this church, one of, the, one of the, the, the founding thoughts with the starting new life was to be a place where everybody could come in and find a place. Whether they're wearing a three-piece suit or flip-flops and shorts, uh, this is where they need to be so they can hear about Jesus. And so that's our, that's our prayer. That's what I hope that, that's, I hope that's your vision uh, for going forward. And uh, so let me take us, Lord, in prayer, uh, and we'll, we'll move along. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity today. Lord, that you brought us to this moment in the life of this church, in the life of this county. Uh, Lord, I, pr- I, I know, Lord, uh, that you're not done. Lord, Uh, The end has not come yet. We know it's getting closer and closer every day. Uh, And, Lord, we could throw up our hands and quit. We could go hide in the mountains and, uh, Lord, just wait for your return like some tried to do so long ago. But, Lord, we know that's uh, that's not what you told us to do. You told us to work. You told us to to share the gospel, to make disciples. And, Lord, that's what we want to do. And so I pray that you just help us as a church, uh, Lord, to be looking to the future. Uh, We can learn from the past. We can learn from history. We can see what happened. Uh, but, Lord, we can, uh, we can look forward with excitement to what the future holds. And, Lord, I pray that that's what we'll focus upon today and in the coming weeks and months, years ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to give you just, uh, today's going to be a little bit different. Uh, I don't even know uh, exactly what all, you know, normally happens at New Life. Uh, today's obviously going to be different. I'm going to give you just a 30,000-foot uh, overview, maybe, of, of my testimony, I guess, of where I am. Uh, really, I'll tell you, be honest with you, some of y'all, I'm, I'm more nervous about Wednesday night than I am tonight, uh, today, because i got to speak to the youth Wednesday night, so that's going to be a little more challenging, but... Just a big, broad overview. I, I was uh, saved at the age of 14 in, in the living room of my mom and daddy's house. Uh, my dad is a pastor, and so uh, he said I had an experience when I was five years old in vacation Bible school. I couldn't remember that, so at 14, it really began to bother me and weigh on me, and I felt uh, conviction about it, just un- unsettledness about my, my eternity and about what God was doing in my life. And so uh, at 14, I just finally broke down and, and told him about it, and, and we prayed and, and made that confirmation. I felt like I was sure then going forward. Uh, as often happens sometimes, though, even though I was raised in a perfect home with, with what I would believe perfect parents, everything was exactly the way it's supposed to be biblically, uh, I decided to take a left turn and go do something else for a while and kind of wandered out in the wilderness like the prodigal son uh, for a few years. Uh, and, you know, thankfully, uh, mom and dad didn't really have a clue what all was going on. I'm glad they didn't. But uh, when the Lord finally got a hold of my heart, he sent me a wonderful woman who looked into me and saw something more in me than I saw in myself. And she said, look, if me and you are going to date and this is going to be serious, then you're going to have to, there's going to be some things that's going to change. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I've been saying yes, ma'am now for 26 years. But uh, the, Lord, the Lord knew exactly what I needed to get my attention, and so He He brought us together. We got married. We started church out. At, went started going to church at Sunshine, Brother.
Brother Arthur and Jeremy and, and their family. And that was exactly what I needed at that time in my life. And God used Brother Arthur in that church to, to really uh, break me and, and, and help me to find out who I was and what God wanted me to do with my life. And, and so it wasn't very long till I felt the call to be a preacher and a little after that to be a pastor. And so my wife went from marrying and, and dating this, this heathen that, that didn't really know what he was doing with his life to all of a sudden now she's a pastor's wife. Uh, and so if any of y'all are feeling the call to, to be a preacher and want to accept that call, I would encourage you to confirm that with your wife before you tell the whole church. It'll work out uh, a lot better for you. Uh, I, I just, uh, the Lord is on me, and I, and I had told her I kind of felt like that might happen, and, and we really didn't follow up with it after that. And one Sunday night, I was just sitting there, and I, I don't necessarily feel like the Lord speaks audibly to us all the time, but in that moment, I felt like he said, it's time to tell them. And so maybe he was saying it's time to tell her, and I thought he said tell her and them, and so I just stood up and said, I feel like I'm called to preach. I don't know when it'll be or where, and Brother Arthur said it'll be this Wednesday night, and so thankfully she has rolled with the punches and been a great pastor's wife. And so we did that and got into ministry, and, and here we are uh, today. As I said, that's a very broad overview, but I can tell you if any of you need to hear more of the details of my life and what I did uh, during that time and, and, and how the Lord worked, then uh, obviously I want to talk to you personally about that, maybe help you with you or your kids or whatever may be going on. But that's where I'm at uh, today and still looking to get forward uh, with excitement to what God is doing. Uh, a few thoughts about uh, ministry philosophy, kind of some things that I think are, are necessary and important uh, within the church. I shared with the leaders just core values. I won't go through all that today, but just a few things I want to share with you. And one is the purpose of the church is discipleship. Disciples making disciples, fulfilling the Great Commission. Every believer is called, is commissioned to make disciples. Every, every believer is gifted to be able to do that. You have different gifts, you have different abilities, but every one of us here today have the ability through the Holy Spirit to make disciples. And that's what every one of us are supposed to be doing on whatever level and whatever stage, whatever platform the Lord's given you, that we are to make disciples. And so the, the purpose for the church is to make disciples. It's not to plant churches. It's not to make converts. It's not to feed the hungry. It's not to clothe the naked. All those things happen, but those are not really the purpose. The purpose is to make disciples. People who follow Jesus. People who make disciples and continue to, to reproduce themselves. Amen? All right. Like I said, I don't know what y'all are used to, but I have to have a little feedback, okay? Uh, we're in this together, all right? Matthew twenty two thirty seven says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so if we're going to fulfill the great commission, we do that through the spirit of the great commandment. We're going to talk more about this next week. But that, that's, he says on this hangs all the law and the prophets. Everything you'll ever want to do to be considered obedient to the Lord is found in these couple of verses. That you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's that. He said, on these two, this is, what, this is what everything else is built on. But listen, until you love God, you'll never love his work. Until you love God, you'll never love his people. Until you love God, you'll never love his word. Paul says that it's the love of Christ that compels us in 2 Corinthians 5.14. It's the love of Christ. It compels us to fulfill the Great Commission. You, you're not, you're, you're, you're not going to just naturally want to go and fulfill the Great Commission. You're not going to naturally just want to love your neighbor or to love God. You're naturally going to want to love yourself. But through the love of Christ within us, he compels us. How many of y'all love the beach and everything the beach has to offer? Raise your hand. Some of you do, okay? Now, how many of you love somebody who loves the beach and therefore you love the beach? Now, raise your hand. A <laughs> lot, 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 lot more men raised their hand that time, right? I... I I, my wife loves the, the, the beach. I always, I've, I've kidded before when we had a home phone, I'd always have to answer the phone because it was, it was a church from the beach, anywhere around the beach, she'd have us moving. I, so I had to kind of filter those phone calls. She loves the beach. I don't really care. Why do you want to go sit in the sunshine and get sand all over you and swim in water that burns your eyes and has things in there that can eat you? I don't understand that. But she loves it. And I love her, so guess what I do? I love the beach. 
But thankfully, because she loves me, she makes that time on the beach a little bit shorter than it would be if she was there by herself. But see, naturally, I wouldn't be there because that's not what I love. But because of her love for me, then I love the beach. You won't want to serve the Lord. The serving the Lord will feel like drudgery. It'll feel like treachery. It'll feel like just a labor unless you have the love of Christ within you. So it compels us to, to follow him. Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And so the purpose of the church is to fulfill the Great Commission. The guide of the church is the Word of God. Everything that we're ever going to do from this point forward, again, I, I, I'm not saying anything about what happened in the past. It was great, good, or otherwise. But everything from here forward, every decision the elders are going to make from here forward is going to be based on the Word of God. It, whether we find it literally their word for I wish it was like that sometimes. I, I looked for a verse that said, leave and go to new life. I was looking for that verse. I wish it was there. It wasn't. Uh, on this Sunday, preach this. For, okay, you know, I wish it was that. It's not that easy, but everything we do can be based on the Word of God. We can find, it can be confirmed by the Word of God. It can, be, it can be found there, the principles through the Word of God. So the guide of the church is the Word of God. The life of the church is the ministry of prayer. We, we've got to be in prayer for anything and everything that God's ever going to do through this church. We've got, I would, I would hope, I hope one of these days that we'll have a prayer ministry. I know you already have one, but in the sense that there is somebody somewhere in this facility and during this hour, hour and a half or two, however long it takes me to preach, however long we're in here, that person is just going to battle on their knees against Satan in prayer for this time because this is the time of the day the time of the week most often that you are fighting your 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 most severe spiritual battle because the devil don't want you to hear what's going to be said up here that the devil wants you to think about what's coming next and think about tomorrow and think about yesterday and, and distract you or tell you this is your time for a nap or whatever it is that there's all kind of distractions that happens and so the the, the prayer the life of the church is the ministry of prayer and I hope one day, somebody, we can work that out. The mission of the church, and this just maybe, I've tried to, to kind of get a couple of churches to adopt this. New Life may or may not one day, but it's become kind of my mission purpose, my purpose statement, I guess. The mission of the church is to train saints to reach sinners as we serve the Savior. Everything that I try to do has got to, I try to, it, just in my personal life. The, the purchases that I make, the things that I do, the way I spend my time, I want it to be doing something in that purpose statement. I, I, I want to be training saints. I want to be training other believers. I want to be discipling a believer to follow the Lord more faithfully. Or I want to be reaching sinners with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that I'm doing, whether it's going to the river, riding dirt roads, I want to be able to use those resources and use that time to try to train somebody to follow the Lord or to reach a sinner while I'm out there and in the and in is all of that is just serving the Savior. Every day when we wake up, we need to have an idea that I'm serving the Savior. And I, I hope that can maybe become your purpose statement. And lastly, the structure of the church is Jesus, the pastor and the elders, the deacons and the members. As I told our leaders when I first there at our potluck meeting the other night, that whenever that model is followed, that church will be blessed by God. It's the same way in the home. When the structure of the home is the way it's supposed to be, God blesses that home, the husband, the wife, and the children. It's not to say one's more important than the other. It's not to say that one is greater than the other. That's just the way God laid it out to be. That's just the model that God gave us that we're to follow. And so that the structure of the church must be followed. And I want to encourage you all to be thankful for your elders that have been able to get up here and speak and preach for the last few weeks, last few months. Because a lot of churches would have been struggling during this time. They'd have had to get somebody from the outside to come in. It had just been a, kind of, kind of a, a nightmare. But you had men that were able to step up immediately and fill this position. And so I want to encourage you to be, be thankful for them. I'm not going to stand. They did. I think they did that last week. Give them a hand. Yeah, Because that's not easy. It's not, it's not easy to get up here and say, thus saith the Lord. I know that's King James, but that's the only way I know how to say that. 
It's not easy to have that responsibility to get up here. So I'm thankful that y'all have men that can, that can do that. And be thankful for your deacons who have been serving and continue to find ways to serve you. They were here this morning early, running all over the place, trying to serve and do what needed to be done to make this day possible. So I'm thankful to have faithful deacons. But look, a, a one, one a group of people that often gets overlooked when we talk about elders and deacons is their wives. And y'all find out I'm a crybaby. I cry about everything, Tony. But they're wives. Because whatever's going on in the church, these elders and these deacons, these leaders in the church, they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to fix it. They're trying to keep it together. They're trying to move forward. And so they get to, they carry the load of the church. And oftentimes their wife can't or, or don't know what all's going on. They can't, we can't share with our wives every detail about everything that everybody's doing and what everybody said. And so all they get to do is just walk beside their husband who they can tell is, is worn out oftentimes. They just got to walk beside him and encourage him and pray for him and help him every way that they can. Even though they don't know exactly what's going on, they've just got to be there. And oftentimes they hear what some people think of their husband. And they don't need to hear that either sometimes when it's negative. Sometimes people think they're the go-between. They'll say something around their wife so maybe their wife will go back and tell them what this person thinks things ought to be. I'm telling you, I've been doing this a long time. I grew up with a daddy doing it all my life. I know, I know how sweet church folks can be. <laughs> so I would encourage you as you are thankful for your elders and you pray for them, their deacons, listen, remember their wives because they're never going to be up here doing very much. You're not going to see their name on a lot of things probably, but, but they are carrying a load as well. And so let's thank the Lord for all of our leaders and their wives. And look, you may not believe this, but you've been on my mind and in my prayers for, for the last few years. There's some of you that I've, been, uh, I've enjoyed fellowshipping with as we labored together already, working together on projects and doing things for the last several years leading up to uh, right now. <clears throat> and so uh, some of you I've already built a, a good relationship with and, and kind of known what was going on in New Life and been, been in prayer with you through some of this. And I'm more than confident that God has not finished what he started 20 years ago. As a matter of fact, I'm confident today that the best days of New Life are still ahead of us. I, I, if it wasn't, God would have stopped this a long time ago. This is God's church. And when he gets ready for it to stop, he'll shut it down. But he hasn't done so yet, regardless of how hard we might have tried <laughs> to mess it up. God still has a church here for a reason. There, there's some here I know that are the original new lifers. And I don't know who all those are. It's just a small group. Will y'all stand up wherever you're at? If you're original, the, I mean, like the, the first few people who said... <laughs> We need, all right, there you go. Yeah. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. Uh, and, and I'm not giving them all the glory for it, but they followed the, 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 the Holy Spirit prompting them to do something uh, that was different. Something that, 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 that they felt like the county needed. And so we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. So I'm thankful that they could, they could be here. And there's others that, I, that aren't, aren't here, but I'm thankful for them. Philippians uh, 1 verse 3 says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I, again, I have no doubt that, that, that God is, is working in new life and has worked in new life for 20 years. Uh, and, and I believe that it, for you, for me as individuals, we can all start a new life every day. I, I like the name of, of the church, you know. I, we might change some things. But we're not going to change that. We're going to leave it alone. But... But you have the opportunity every day when you wake up to start a new life. It's a new opportunity. The, the, the past is gone and the new has come. And, and I believe if we look at Psalms 139, we'll see David had a desire to start a new life. In Psalms 139, verse 23, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. 
See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If you're a believer today, that should be your daily desire. Every day when you wake up, Lord, show me what needs to be removed from my life. Show me what needs to be added to my life. Show me the weaknesses in my life. Show me what I need to do that I can better serve you. Try me. Prove me. Reveal my anxieties. Do we want... Do we really want God to reveal our anxieties and our weaknesses? Do we want him to reveal the things that are wrong with us? Listen, you're the only one that you can control. You're the only one that you you have any power over. It's easy for us to identify everybody else's weaknesses. It's easy for us to identify everybody else's anxieties and their problems and their shortcomings and what they need to change about their life. It's not so easy for us to change that about ours. So David says, try me. Show me what the weaknesses are in my life so that I can, so I can confess those, so we can remove those and, and get those out of, out of, out of my life. Now, I don't know how many of y'all, you know, back in my day running around, we, you go try, try out a used car. I mean, actually, what's one of the things that old, a car's got to do? You, you put, the, put the gas to it. It's, it's got to burn the tires, right? Now, are we going to need to do that every day? No. My wife asked one time, why, why do you do that when we go drive a car? I said, because I want to know it will if I want to. <laughs> and if it won't, why, we're not buying it. You know, it's, it's got, what am I doing? I'm trying it. I'm testing it. Unfortunately, things like that I hadn't grown out of yet. They're still, they're still that. My, my truck now has dual exhaust on it, and I, I like it. She says, I told her one time, so I think it helps the, the fuel economy, you know, when you have dual exhaust. She said, no, it makes it worse because you want to hear it all the time. But what are we doing? We're, we, we tried it, didn't we, to see what it would do. When you ask God to try you, listen, that's a bigger prayer than any of us really can fathom. I, I, really, can't, I really can't grasp the magnitude of that prayer when I ask God, my creator, the God of all the universe, to squeeze me, to, to try, to load me down, to put the gas to the floor and just see what I can do. When that happens, we don't know what's going to come out. We don't know what might break. But David said, God, I don't want to walk around with this false mentality that I've got it all together and I'm stronger than I am. I want you to squeeze me and see what comes out. Is that your desire today? Again, I know we can point out everything's wrong with these elders and how sorry they are and the deacons and son, you know, all this stuff. I almost said Sunday school teacher. We don't have those. They were small group leaders. We can point out all that's wrong with them and tell God to weigh them down and, and, stri- and try them. But God, try me. Show me what needs to change in my life. If we're going to move forward as a church family, we all must have the same desire. When God reveals sin in our life through his word and through his spirit, we've got to confess it and repent of it right then. Right then. I'm talking about cold turkey. Some of you smoke and, and we and dip and all, and we try to taper off. And I'm not I'm not calling that sin. I'm just saying it, it is. It hurts your body. But I'm not I'm not focusing on that. <laughs> I'm not focusing on that right now. I'm just saying we want to kind of taper off things that we like, but we can't do sin that way. When God reveals it to us and He says this is sin, we've got to we've got to cut it out right then. We Rick Burgess the other night was talking and, and they, they asked Sherry, when did he start to lose weight and try to be more healthy about his life? What, what made the change? He'd been, you know, uh, one of the sexiest fat men alive, you know. He's been one of those guys all his life. What made him change? And she said, when he realized it was sin. That's what got his attention and he began to change. How many of us, if you went to the doctor tomorrow and the doctor said, you've got, you've got this cancerous tumor in you. It's going to kill you. It's not going to be real quick. I mean, it'll take several years. But ultimately, it's going to kill you if we don't get it out. How many of you would say, well, you know, I kind of like it being there. I, can we just, can I come in once a month and we'll just cut a little of it off and, you know, I'll come, we'll see how that goes. And if it don't work, then I'll come back next month and we'll cut a little bit more of it out and test it and see how that goes. And how, what, what kind of fool would, would want to do that with cancer? 
What would we tell him? Cut it out. Get it gone. I want it gone. all of it gone. But when God reveals sin in our life, it's just like a cancer. It may not kill you instantly, but it will lead to death. With our sin, we go, well, you know, I'm on, I've been watching pornography every night. So I'm just going every other night. I'll try that and see if that kind of helps me feel a little bit better. Or whatever sin it is. I can't go through the categories today. Whatever it is that we're struggling I'll just cut a little bit of it. No, we've got to get it all out right then. Cold turkey, walk away from it. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do that. Kevin said it a few weeks ago. Partial obedience is disobedience. See, we, we, we all sometimes fall guilty of, uh, of sins of, of, of omission that we may not really realize is sin right now in our life. And we're, we're just not there. Mature, we haven't matured enough yet. We're not in the Word enough yet. Maybe we, God hadn't revealed. But once we are there and it's revealed and there's no doubt about it, it's got to go. Because if it doesn't, our Heavenly Father will discipline us until it does. See, I grew up with parents who firmly believed in, in whipping. You know, I know we're in a new age now and some people think that's not the way to do it, but I still believe it is. And, and so when he told me to do something, thankfully it all happened when I was so young, we don't remember a lot of it, but... But it, but it got my attention. And so when he says do something, that, that to me, if I don't do that, that's disobedience. And if you disobey what I've told you to do, then this is coming. We didn't talk about it. You know, he didn't explain it. It's just, this is what you're going to do. I raised my kids the same way. Go clean your room. Why? It don't matter. Your mama said clean your room. And if it didn't happen, there was consequences to follow. When God says this is sin and I want it out of your life, he don't want to talk about it. He don't want to discuss it. He wants it gone, and we've got to get rid of it. Look at Hebrews. I don't know how many of y'all carry Bibles anymore. I'm going to be challenging you. They'll bring your Bible with you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore we, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, that's talking about personal responsibility, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us, Run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I've got these weights up here that at one time I tried to kind of use them to exercise, but I hadn't done it in a while. But imagine this is some sin in our life that God's revealed. And we kind of like it. We think that they're, they, they, we think they make us look cool. And, and so we're, everybody's carrying them now. And so we got our weight and we're carrying it. And God's saying, that's the very thing that keeps tripping you up. Why do you keep picking? I want you to lay down the sin that so easily ensnares you. That means you know exactly what it is. It's not a doubt. It's not a question. We know exactly what our weaknesses are. And so he says, lay that down so that you can run with endurance. And so we will. We'll have an emotional experience at church, and we lay that weight down. Oh, we feel so much better. And we raise our hands, and we worship, and we thank the Lord throughout that entire worshipful time in our life, whether it's an hour or whether it's a six months, maybe even a year goes by, and then all of a sudden one day, we go, I, I wonder if I can handle it now. It tripped me up back then, but I think I can handle it this time. So let me try it. And we begin, we pick it right back up. And before long, we realize we're weighed right back down. We're carrying that old sin around, carrying that weight around that so easily ensnares us. And look, the word of God's not going to change. If it tripped you up 20 years ago, it's going to trip you up now. If it was sin 20 years ago, it's going to be sin now. It's not going to change just because we are different or feel better about it. We have a personal responsibility to obey Scripture. Our new nature will not be at peace while carrying around willful sin. And one of the, the, the things we try to think about in if we're a Christian or not, or if I've been really saved or not, is how do I respond to sin in my life? Can I just live with willful disobedience and not feel any conviction about it? Does, am I comfortable living in a lifestyle of sin? And if so, 
you're not a Christian. Let that sink in just a second. I don't care how much money you give to the church. I don't care how many, how often you sit in, in a seat at church and how many sermons you've heard. Maybe you've been up on this stage and done something. The Holy Spirit will not allow us to live in open, willful sin without disciplinary action. That's just the Bible, and I can't get time to share all that with you this morning. We've got to get the, 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 the new nature won't allow the old nature to dominate. There's going to be a battle. I'm not saying you're not going to lose the battle sometimes, but there's going to be a battle. See, during that time of my, what I call prodigal years, nobody else knew it. My buddies thought I was just like them, and in some ways I thought I was just like them. But every time we got together, there was a knot in my stomach I had to drink out before I could ever start acting like they were acting. I, it never was right, and finally it got to the point where, where I was afraid to go to sleep at night. I was afraid I was going to die and go to hell. I was afraid that I, something terrible would happen in my life if I didn't change. And I believe that was the Holy Spirit warning me. It's time, if you don't turn around, you're destroying your witness. You're destroying what I want you to do with your life. And if you, I've given you t opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to turn around. And if you don't turn around, you're going to die. Some people in our world don't think that God does that anymore. But if God can wipe out a whole nation to make a point, you better believe he can wipe out one soul to make a point. And so I had to change. We had to get it out of our life. As a believer, my life is not about me. It's about him. We just sang that song, Gratitude. What have we got to bring to a king other than ourselves? Other than our pray, other than just a hallelujah, that, that song tears me up all the time. What am I? Who am I? I stood up here Friday when it was nobody here but me, just looking around, thinking, Lord, who am I to be the pastor of this church, to be the pastor of any church? Who am I? We've got to understand it's not about me, it's not about us. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. How many of y'all live for what makes you happy? Somebody told you somewhere along the way you need to get, you're not happy. I'm not happy. I want to be happy. And somebody said, well, I'm married. And since I've been married, I've been happy. You ought to get married. If you'll get married, you'll be happy. And so you find somebody and, and, and you get married and you think, well, wow, I'm happy. We go on the honeymoon and we're happy and we come home and we're happy and all of a sudden something happens along the way and, and all of a sudden we're not happy anymore. Well, then you got these, these cool, happy, divorced friends. And so that's all. You need to get a divorce. If you get a, I got a divorce and I'm a lot happier now than I was before. So you need to get a divorce. And so, I, well, okay, well, that's what I'll do. So we get a divorce. And we're happy. We're free. We run. We do whatever we want to do. We're happy. And then all of a sudden... Well, we're not happy anymore. So somebody tells us another, something else. Maybe while we're married, somebody, we're not happy. And so they say, well, you need to have children. My children have been such a blessing to me. And I just love them. They're my heart. They're my life. Y'all just need to have a kid. And if you'll have a child, you'll be happy then. So you have a child. Something's just, just not happy. Maybe, you, maybe you, 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 you're wanting a, a, you're not really wanting to be married. You're just... Something happens, and you find yourself pregnant, and everybody says, oh, that baby's going to destroy your life. That baby, you're never going to, you won't be able to go to school, you won't be able to get this job, you won't be able to follow your career, you're not going to be, you know, you're going to miss out on so much if you have that baby. If you have that baby, you're not going to be happy. So you get an abortion, and maybe for a little bit you feel happy, but it never leaves your mind what could have been. Listen, I'm not, again, I, I know I'm chasing a little bit of rabbit here, but if any of this has happened, listen, God is full of forgiveness today. There, there may have been some bad decisions then. Like I said, even for our church, there, there may have been some decisions that were made in the past that maybe should or shouldn't have been made. We can't change that. But what we can change is what we do today going forward. So whatever decision you might have made in the past to be happy 
Maybe it didn't turn out like you thought it would. You can't change that, but you can confess it to the Lord and let him change everything from here going forward and be who God has created you to be. Because listen, it's not about us. Our nature is to live for ourselves. Our nature is to be right regardless of who we hurt. Our nature is to view God as a genie in the bottle. Our nature is to follow our heart and make decisions based on emotion. Our nature is to pursue happiness instead of holiness. But if we'll pursue holiness, you'll find out God will provide happiness. We get it backwards, though. The devil gives it backwards. He, he gives us a counterfeit happiness, a counterfeit holiness. But when we follow the holiness of God... He makes us happy, and then he gives us what we call joy that lasts. I want to begin to wrap this up and, and, and bring you to a point of, of decision, a point of invitation. 2 Corinthians 5.15 again says, He died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. We're not living for ourselves. We're living for him. And if you'll take the focus off of you, you'll find out life following Jesus is not nearly as complicated as we make it. We make it complicated because we try to put our wants in the way and our desires in the way instead of what God wants for us. And so he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Maybe that's what you need today is just a new, fresh start. And you're sitting here saying, well, that's what I thought I needed last week. And I, I went forward for that new, fresh start. And before dark Sunday night, I messed it up again. You know why you're alive today? So you can have a new, fresh start again. You can start fresh and new and confessing every day, Lord, I want you to show me what it is that trips me up. Reveal that, that sin that so easily ensnares me so that I won't, I won't keep stumbling and falling. For the born-again believer, who are you living for today? What, what drives you every day? Why are you here? Why do you attend new life? Are you living for him who died for you and rose again? Are you fulfilling the great commission in the spirit of the great commandment? If not, we just found out the Bible calls that disobedience. Are you confident this morning that God has started something in you? And if so, are you trusting him to finish what he started in your life? For those of you that may be lost today, and I, I feel more confident that there's a lost person here today than I did about me coming here as your pastor, and I'm pretty confident about that. But out of a crowd this big, I'd be foolish to think everybody here is a born-again believer. For those of you that are lost, do you want to have a new life? Are you tired of fighting the struggles of this life alone? Are you tired of living for yourself and never finding real peace, real purpose, and real satisfaction? I'm not telling you God's going to fix everything. If you came in today with a power bill that was overdue, it's still going to be overdue when you walk out those doors. If you came in today with a sorry husband that, that, was a, that, that, that didn't go to work and didn't do the things he needed to do, he's still going to be there when you get home. If you, if you came in today with a family that was just in chaos and kids that wouldn't, wouldn't obey and, and was just, your life was just, was just hell, when you go out of here, a lot of that's still going to be there. I'm not telling you God's going to fix everything and make your life a bed of roses. But I am telling you, when you come to know Jesus as your Savior, in those hard moments... He gives you peace. He gives you confidence. He gives you assurance. So maybe that's what you're looking for today. Are you experiencing conviction of sin and a desire for forgiveness and salvation? Lastly, I'm not asking if you want to be saved from hell. Every sound-minded person wants to be saved from hell. Nobody wants to go to hell. I'm asking you if you want to be saved from yourself. Do you want to be saved from your sin nature? Do you want to be saved from being an enemy of God? That's what salvation is. It's not about missing hell. If that's your only idea about salvation, it's no wonder you're not fulfilling the Great Commission. You check the box. I don't have to go to hell and I can do whatever I want to do. I'm not going to re-preach that thought of that, about that. But listen, you'll hear me say it a lot. That's not a born-again believer. So I want to challenge you. If you don't know Jesus, I want you to come. And if you do and you just need that new start, 
Put everything behind you and go forward from here, whether it's forgiveness to offer, whether it's forgiveness to ask for, whether it's some sin that you need to lay down, whatever it is that's back there, and you want to go forward from here forward as a believer, I want to challenge you to come. I'm going to be here. As I said, I don't know what all happens here, but this is what's going to happen today. I'm going to be here. I think there's prayer partners that will be here and, and pray with you, and I'm going to close us in a word of prayer. And I'll be down here at the front. If you want me to pray with you, if you just want to come down here and do business with the Lord, I want to challenge you to come. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for the time, Lord, of, of invitation where you, you invite us to come and do business with you. Lord, when Peter preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 souls got saved. Lord, they made a decision that day to come to you. And Lord, I pray if there's a lost soul here today, I pray they'll come to know you as their Savior. If there's a disobedient child of yours here today, I pray right now, Lord, they would confess that and come to know you. Lord, in a, in a real way, in a, in a submissive way, in a father-son, father-daughter way. Lord, I pray that they would surrender to you right now. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and come on?
shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. been awesome today. Uh, I just, I'm telling you, this, this singing, music, everything, it just all blows my mind. 
Uh, just thankful to the Lord for being here. Uh, I know there's a few announcements needs, announcements needs to be made. Uh, and they're going to be up there in a minute. But the, the 11th, I think there's a women's uh, brunch. The 18th is our Blue Line ministry. Uh, Tony's a part of it. It'll be out here. Uh, the inflatables that day, taking care of law enforcement. If you want to come help with that. Um, I know there's several other things. I don't remember what all it is. Kevin told me, let's, let's take all the memory out of it. Kids, yeah, if you want to sign up for that, I think November the 16th is when you got to sign up. Uh, your kids will be a part of that. So y'all will be able to see that. That will be rolling while we're, while we're dismissing. Uh, main thing I want to tell you is hang around. Uh, we've got uh, a bunch of hot dogs and hamburgers uh, that somebody's going to have to eat. And so uh, we'll ch ask you, though, to get one of whichever one you want to get. I know typically I like to get a hamburger and a hot dog. Uh, and if there's plenty left over, you can come back and get all you want. Uh, but with the crowd, we've got 500. There's 250 hamburgers, 250 hot dogs. Uh, so there's two different lines. We've got a hot dog line and a hamburger line. So I know that's tough. you got to make a decision. We're, we're not good at making commitments. So when you get out there, you got to make a commitment, one or the other, to start with, uh, and, and, get, and just get one if you don't mind. And then, as I said, when we get everybody goes through, uh, then you can come back and, and eat all you want. Uh, but hang around this evening. Uh, me and Cindy will be around. If you want to talk to us, I'd love to meet you. Probably won't remember everybody's name. Uh, but I'd love to meet you and get to know you. And so just come around and, and see us uh, and hang out. This, don't be in a hurry. Uh, just hang around and, and get to enjoy this family time we have together. All right? Anything else? Don't think else we should do? All right, that's it. All right, then. Good deal. Uh, well, I'll ask uh, Kevin, you close us in prayer, if you don't mind. Let's pray. God, we just thank you. Thank you for what you're doing here at New Life, God. We thank you for 20 years. God, as we go out into our mission field, all the places in that video, God, I pray that you would just give us the courage and the boldness to be your disciples, to tell the world about the hope that you've given us. God, we love you. We thank you so much. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he did on the cross, taking our place, God, taking our, our sin on him and let our lives reflect and glorify your goodness, God. We love you, we thank you, we ask all this in his name, amen.